This week's interview, of course, is with Tom Youngblood of the band Camelot. Tom, it's great to have you on the show. And what is current? What does Camelot currently have going on? Well, yeah, we just got done with our North American tour for the new album, The Shadow Theory, which came out in April. Um, and it was our biggest North American tour by far, like bigger, the biggest venues, biggest attendance. So we're like psyched about the about the fact that the band is still growing in, in, the, in North America, which is which is great. Um, so we just got done with that tour, and we're going to be coming back probably in May and June next year. So we're already looking at those dates. And then the next thing up for us is the summer festivals in Europe. Then we do a, our first European tour for this album cycle in uh, September, October. So there's lots going on. We're keeping super busy, which is which is good. Um, yeah, so we're just psyched about the you know the next two years you know working for this record and promoting it. Now, Tom, when I go and listen to albums, I really go in and listen to the back catalog of the band and the albums that came before it to give myself a little bit of a better perspective of, you know, the stuff you put out beforehand. So, you know, when I look, when I look at these last three albums that you've put out, and I'm talking about the albums with Tommy singing, I think this is the best out of the three. I think that this third album, you know, you got some new blood in the band and everything, you know, back when, you know, Silverthorn came out, but... I really think this one is, you know, the best out of those three albums. And and talk about the album a bit. Talk about some of the songs, and you know, let's talk about your new album. Yeah. Well, first I want to say thank you for for those uh, comments. Um, well, I think um, you know, like you said, when you first have a new blood in the band, there's there's going to be some sort of um, changes, of course, you know. But I think with Silverthorn, we wanted to make sure that. It was a continuation of what we were doing. Um, so we really went for that, you know, not getting too far outside of the box, making sure the fans, you know, kind of got what they expected. Um, and then with Haven, we, we started to build on that. And, we, you know, Tommy became more uh, integral into the songwriting. Um, you know, working with Oliver now as a songwriter, too, is, is definitely um, been a game changer for us because he's got so many cool ideas and it you know it, it adds a new element to that camelot sort of backbone so i think with uh, the shadow theory um you know we, we were able to kind of build on those two albums and, and kind of bring in you know what we did with those two records but also add new stuff and you know i'll be honest with you there you know when i first heard the record um I loved it, but I knew that there'd be a a small part of the fan base that would be like, well, this is too different, you know? But then then I'll have someone that says, wow, this is exactly like what I love from the Black Halo. So you never know what people are going to like. You never know what to expect. You know, what we do is we always have the philosophy of just do the absolute best that you can. Try to write for yourself and and hope that the fans kind of understand what you're doing, you know? And that's that's kind of what we've always that's been our kind of philosophy from day one and it's worked. And it's really important for us, even though sometimes people just want the same thing over and over, it's important for us to always add new elements. Right. This record we we've done that again. Um you know, some of the older fans have probably challenges them a little bit, but that's, that's, I think that's good. Now, as a songwriter, Tom, I have to ask you this. Do you go into the studio and do you plan out what kind of songs you want to write, or does it just come to you? Do you just write whatever comes to mind? And, and I know when I've gone in and, and written stuff, it, I basically write what first comes to mind. I don't really have this this thing of, hey, I'm going to make this song sound like this i just kind of start writing and that's how how it how basically goes for me so for you do you plan out what you're going to write or does it just you know you just write what what you're thinking and what you're feeling at the time definitely i mean we always have to challenge ourselves personally and uh, musically to do something new and different and fresh i mean all you know we obviously we want to keep some of that uh that original dna that is camelot and i think we we're able to do that with every record even even when you listen to the first album you hear some of these sort of glimpses of what's going what's to come you know mm-hmm. um so that's always been a philosophy of ours and um and i don't know i mean it's important if we did the same album we did another haven for example there would be people complaining about it. So we really work hard. And, you know, I looked at bands as a kid growing up, bands like Queen, for example, 
they never put out the same record. I mean, if you expected one of their records to be the same after it, you'd be super disappointed, and they didn't do that. And that's one of the bands that I looked up to as a kid growing up, but they were able to do things, not be put in a box with each record, you know? Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to go back in time a little bit because I remember when I first started doing the show, getting a copy of Dominion, actually you contacted me initially, and then we had a, you sent a copy of the album Dominion to me. Then you changed singers, and then Noise Records sent me this copy of Siege Perilous. And I'll be honest with you, I wasn't really too big on either one of those albums. I didn't think they were all that great. And then all of a sudden, one day, I get this promo copy of The Fourth Judgment. And you started work working with Sasha Path, and then you started also working, you know, you know, basically putting some better songwriting into the album. And that album, The Fourth Legacy, just blew me away. Completely blew me away. And then, it, you know, you guys put out a good string of consistent records. And then later on, you know, right before the last album that you did with Roy, I, I really wasn't a big fan of. I, I thought it was a little bland. But then when he came out with Silverthorn with a new singer with Tommy Karavik, it just rejuvenated the band a little bit. It was a big turning point, and the album was pretty much, in my opinion, just pretty much awesome. So, you know, talk about those two major turning points in the band and, you know, in the significance of them. Yeah, I mean, you know, with, with, with Siege Perilous and if you look at Poach for the Poison, those were both records that were in transition. I mean, we had member changes, so we had... Um, uh, time crunches, for example. The, to me, neither one of those records were re actually finished like they should have been. We either ran out of time or people that were in the band just re refused to work on it anymore. So um, that's probably one of the things about it, you know. And for sure, the fourth legacy, you know, uh, having Roy as a, a full time member and a writer, Sasha and Miro were just amazing when it came to. You know, taking what we had and and just really saying, this is this is where I see you guys. You know, this is what you should focus on these elements, and that was huge for us. Um, so those two guys, you know, Sasha's still with us. He's like one one of the members of the band, and um, and I think that that record was pivotal into the, you know the, the whole next journey for for Camelot from for the from the last eighteen years. Mm -hmm. um, for Silverthorn, like I said, I mean, there was, um, you know, member change, and we really wanted to focus on making sure we wrote a record that let people know, hey, this is this is band is not going anywhere. It's actually better than before, you know. Mm -hmm. And we see that now with the, this being our, the, you know, the third record with Tommy, that the the fan base has actually grown. I mean, we've, like I just said, we we had our North American tour, we had sold out shows, bigger bigger shows than we've ever played in, in the U.S. So. Uh, it's it's exciting to to see that uh, that transition and also that evolution. You know, you put your first albums out in the mid '90s, and you know, obviously, metal really wasn't all that big back then. And was it difficult for you guys starting out? Was it really difficult for you to start this band during a time when metal really wasn't all that big? You know, we didn't really. Everybody was working jobs, and we weren't really. It was a, the thing was more of a hobby. You know, we love what we were doing for. You know, we worked on it for five years before anybody even heard of us, and then we finally were able to make a record and didn't have to spend a ton of money on our own, you know, so we were excited about that. Um, so we weren't, we didn't, it wasn't like we felt like, Oh, this is uh this is, this sucks, you know, because we were excited to be playing music we loved and, and it was being released worldwide. And, uh, one of the reasons we went straight for the European market is because it was still relevant in Europe and Germany and there were festivals going on at the time. And, um, so we never really felt that kind of weird, like, oh, this is we shouldn't be playing this kind of music feel, you know? We just loved what we were doing and took it from there. We never really thought about the whole grunge thing and all that that was kind of crushing metal at the time, you know? Mm -hmm. you know every time I open up a Camelot album, I see a big list of guest musicians. And, you know, of all the people that you've worked with and have ha had as a guest on the albums, over the years, who are some of your favorite people to work with over the over this past, you know, say, you know, 15, 20 years you guys have been around? Oh, well, you know, it's funny because a lot of people are like, oh, you know, you got female vocals now. I mean, we were doing that in 2000 with Fourth Legacy. We, we had female vocalists. My 
wife was on the Fort Legacy and she was on the Black Halo and um, so it's been really fun and interesting to always have this sort of guest here and there you know and I mean obviously Alyssa White Glues is, it stands out um, a lot of fans will know who she is working with Elise Ridd from Amaranth was, was awesome my wife um, you know we're working with Lauren Hart now she's great um, but they're all just uh, unique and special in their own way and that's one of the reasons why we always pick these these different individuals whether someone's heard of them or not we really try to find people that are unique uh, vocally and also you know as artists that are special they add something that may be something that people haven't heard before you know Roy was so, uh, just an amazing vocalist for you guys and uh, you know every time you replace a vocalist it's always very difficult to do so and I think Tommy Karavik has done a great job at doing that and what was it about him that made you say you know what we want this guy in our band well I've always had this uh, love for Scandinavian uh, vocals I mean um, whether you look back at Europe or AHA or even ABBA I mean this this approach to melody is just always gold you know um and when i heard some of the songs from tommy's um, other band seventh wonder i just knew that he would fit um you know the other the next test would be like how would he integrate with the band in terms of touring and we toured we did a full tour um he was um doing backup vocals but then coming out and doing a couple songs live and we just knew that that he was a guy you know um and you know there's 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 probably a lot of examples of member changes but you can look at from black sabbath to van halen to, i mean there's so many acpc iron Maid singer changes it happens and it works you know um mm -hmm. i think a lot of people forget those examples where it works because they don't think about it you know right but um yeah i think that whole you know just that approach vocally i knew was was going to work and um, when we did Song for Jolie, that was the first song we kind of sent to him as a sort of a test. He wrote all the melodies and the lyrics. And we were just like, wow, okay, this is the guy, you know. You know, you guys have really done very well for yourselves over the last few years, and especially since the music business s sort of started taking its downturn right around the time you guys really kind of, you know, when it came out with the fourth legacy and really started getting a little bit bigger. And how have you guys adapted to the current times as far as the music industry goes? Well, I think we're fortunate to have I've already had our foot in the door, um, you know, because now we see the returns on youtube plays or returns on spotify um and we still sell physical we our fans are are cool i mean they, they still buy physical records so we, we're kind of able to sort of touch on all all those platforms and you know i try to tell bands new bands look you know uh you need to focus on the songs but also make sure you're putting out good videos spend the money on visuals because that's going to be your first impression nowadays it's not going to be you know a, a picture in a magazine because they don't exist anymore you know yeah you know, the the first impression is so important now and you got it and the, to me it's, it's about videos you know making sure you make good videos um if you're a new band so that you let people know you're out there and i think that attracts uh, the fans and hopefully if, if the band looks decent and they sound good it's going to help you know well you know when you talk about physical See physical copies and people buying that stuff it seems like vinyl has helped that out a little bit and has that helped you guys out at all i don't think the volume is is, is where where it would be like a huge help i mean it, it is there it is there is a, a percentage of vinyl being sold um but what i see in the future is um what the fans are going to buy is these special limited things that um you, you normally wouldn't be able to buy at, at best buy or wherever you get your music you know as mm -hmm. a physical product um you know i, I unless there's a new platform but I, I think it's just the convenience factor is just too huge for people that they just to be able to just listen to something on their phone or on the computer at home is it's just um taking over and all the stores that you know that used to sell physical you either order it online or you, or you don't get it you know? right but um we're gonna we continue to write records like we used like we used to we make an album hoping that someone's going to buy the thing listen to it from the beginning to the end that's mm -hmm. that's the way that our philosophy has been you know that that model might change you know maybe in five years you release one song and 
every three months or something. You know? Right. We'll see. We'll see what happens. But for now, we're really fortunate. We have fans that, that buy CDs, they buy vinyl, they buy the limiteds. Um, you know, and I, I don't want it to be just a thing where you tour and sell merch and that's it. it you know, the music is, is second. You know, it should be first. You know? Right. Well, you know, for me, there's nothing like putting a CD in a, in a really big stereo or a piece of vinyl on and cranking it up when you get home, you know? The sound is so much better. I mean, but a lot of people, like I said, they're, they'd rather sacrifice sound for convenience. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't, we've never been the band that's like complaining about the whole thing because it, it, it really it doesn't help. And it, And to me, it's like... This is a platform that's going to be the future. And right. Fortunately, fortunately or not, yeah, maybe it helps the bands because you don't have to spend money making something and shipping it. Um, but for now, you know, we really embrace, we still embrace, um, you know, I, I really am I'm into the two CD thing so that the fans are getting everything for the money. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I could see a thing where we do vinyl and a CD and the vinyl so that you know, they're getting both, the best of both worlds. But right. it's always a philosophy. If you somebody's going to spend money, you want to make sure that they're happy. Now, you know, it's interesting, though, too, because, you know, I, I see a lot of young kids buying vinyl and really listening to it. And I thought that was something that I, I don't think I'd ever would have even imagined years and years ago of ever this ever happening. Well, my, my daughter's 15, and she is into, she's very eclectic. She likes Beatles to Louis Armstrong to AJR. So, but she has vinyl. She That's what she wants for Christmas. That's what, what she wants for her birthday. And so it's super cool to see that. And maybe that is, maybe that comes back and it becomes in a way a weird standard again who knows but for now it's very cool to see that <clears throat> the the uh, younger generation is is embracing it for sure you know i think the new album is just one of my favorites you guys have put out and it's got a lot to it and if i had to compare it to another album you guys have put out it would be the album epica not really from the musical standpoint but the fact that it's a very diverse record mm, i can see that there's the riffing is a little bit more i would say intricate uh, on some of the songs a little bit more i don't know if the word progressive is correct but um yeah i could understand where you where you could get that feel you know because the epica record was a little bit um it's very dynamic but also filled with a lot of music like musical parts um so that i could totally see where you get that vibe from i mean we didn't think about it we didn't really go into the record thinking too much about <clears throat> what it what it's going to sound like in terms of like what we did before but um yeah i could i could understand where you kind of get that vibe i mean there's also a song you know like vespertine which could have been on fourth legacy or kevlar skin um so we wanted to bring back a little bit of that uh, heritage, I guess you could say, to to the album, but also build on it and, and add new elements. And right. Um, so we worked we worked for you know pretty much eight months working on the record, um, recording and doing all the different parts for it. So it, we're really happy with the way it came out. Well, you know, the word progressive, in my opinion, I think is a great description of the album, and I'll correct you a little bit on that because you know what's great about this new record is the fact that. It's not the typical Camelot album. When I listen to it, I, there's a lot of twists and turns in songs that I am just, you know, I just wasn't expecting when I was listening to it. Oh, that's good to hear. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, I mean, um, I'd say this definitely has more progressive elements than the last two albums. I mean, uh, and I guess you could say last three albums, but um, it wasn't a conscious thing that we did. You know, like I said, a lot of this stuff is super organic and just happens. Um, and a lot of times I'll pull back some progressive elements because I just don't want it to be too artsy fartsy, for example. You know, I want to, a lot of times I want to just get straight to the point with things. But on this album and some of these songs, you know, like Proud and the Broken, I just kind of let it be. And, and, um, I'm glad I did because, you know, that, that came out to be one of my favorite songs on the record. You know, and I've been there before because it's like, when you write a song and it's like 10 minutes long and then you take six minutes of it out and then, oh my, oh my God, it sounds a lot better than it did before. And then you can use those other parts for, you know, other stuff down the road. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, a lot of times we'll, we, we don't have time for reflection because we work up to the very last second of any deadline that we're given. Right. And, um, you know, and that's why sometimes we'll wake up, we'll do a video and I'm like, hey, I want to cut these parts out because... It's a video, first of all, and it shouldn't be like 
six, seven minutes long. I want to make it like straight to the point. And we'll do, well, sometimes we'll do different versions for the videos. And mm -hmm. That's, um, you know, and I think in the future I'll probably spend more time reflecting on certain things. But on this record, you know, we really felt like we want to keep everything just like it is. And, um, I'm glad we did. You know, with me recording, you know, an album, it, it, and I'm do, and if I'm doing it myself or we're doing it ourselves, you know, you start reflecting on things, and you start overthinking everything and overanalyzing stuff. Yeah, that's that's a total musician's uh, curse and blessing in a way. I mean, um, you know, when you get so stuck into writing something, and at first you look digging it, then you you start putting other parts on, and then you listen to it again, you're like, oh, maybe this is not not as cool as I thought it was, you know, and then maybe you'll play it for somebody and they're like, this is amazing. So then you kind of, um, you know, get the validation of your initial first gut instinct. And I think that's, that's another thing too, is just you go with your gut on so many things that you usually, you usually come out on top. You've had some pretty amazing guest musicians as we talked before in the interview. Uh, is there anybody out there who w you would be interested in working with that you haven't already? I really like uh, Tina Guau. She's a cellist. She's, she tours with Hans Zimmer. And we've been, we went back and forth with a couple of emails you know, discussing maybe joining us on, a, on an album or a special event. Um, there's a singer in Norway called Marion Raven uh, that I would love to work with. Um, she's more of a pop singer, but I think... You know, if we did a battle with her, I think it'd be really special. Um, yeah, those two kind of stick out. Um, but there's so many cool artists out there that, you know, I could see working with at some point. Um, and that's one of the cool things I think about Camelot. You know, we don't really have to do it, but for some reason we end up doing it every time because it's it's just fun. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it's cool because, you know, you have a guest come in, you come up with something cool, then then it uh you know it turns out to be something great in the album i mean you know how it is you know it's yeah, yeah and it's um like with, with lauren i mean we played a show with iron maiden in california in july last year and uh cobra page was doing the clean vocals for us and she's friends with lauren hart from once human and she's like do you want lauren to come out and do the liar liar the fisto i'm like yeah awesome and we met her and and um we hit it off really well in terms of you know like uh personalities and she did a killer job so we had her on the record and she did the phantom divine video um and then she did the full north american tour with us and she just crushed it so we we're you know just little things like that make it exciting with each with each album cycle too you know obviously Khan left on pretty good terms with you guys uh roy Khan, and you know down the road you know now he's doing music again obviously he decided hey i want to do this again and you know would you work with him down the road well, you know, like we're we're still friends. I mean, we have to, we work together on the back catalog. We we we're partners on the old albums. And as soon as I heard about it, I, I sent him and Tora um, email saying I'm super excited about Conception Reunion. You know, because that 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 was an amazing band. You know, and I really if it wasn't for Conception, I would have known about about Roy. So mm -hmm. um, I was excited to hear about it. And Tora's amazing guitar player, songwriter. Um, you know what happens in the future. I don't, I don't really think too much about that, you know. We're, but we'll definitely be, you know, hanging out. And the same with Casey, you know, our, our drummer. We're we're all good friends, man. This is, mm -hmm. life is short, you know. I mean, uh, if the biggest problem and and in, in, uh, is is who's singing or in, in Camelot, then that's you should consider yourself lucky, you know. Uh, right. So we kind of look at, at all these little things as just part of the journey, you know, and it's. Um, I think it's important to handle those kind of situations as professional as possible, and I think we did that. And, mm -hmm. and I'm just excited to to, to know that he's, he's still singing. You know? Yet again, Tom, it was great to have you on the radio show. And any last words for any of the fans who are going to be checking this interview out on my radio show and later, obviously, in the podcast and everything else? Yeah, well, I want to say thank you, of course, for your support over the years. And obviously, um, you know, the support from the North American fans, you know, both in Canada and the U.S. were amazing on this recent tour. And to everybody listening, anybody that's in Europe or Asia, uh, we're going to be coming to see you guys pretty soon. And we're coming back to North America in May. Uh, we have some uh, very cool special guests coming with us. And I know you're in Cleveland. I'm pretty sure Cleveland's on the list for the, the second leg. And mm -hmm. so we're excited about um, about bringing uh, you know this album and more songs from this record. And um, yeah, it's just going to be an amazing uh, amazing time over the next few years. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank everybody for that.